So we're recounting the travels of the Radha Mani as he searches for the recipient the greatest mercy from the Lord. So we heard how Narada Mani had come to meet with Lord Shiva. And he was glorifying Lord Shiva as a Okay. So Narada Muni heard from Lord Shiva that he was not the greatest Vaishnava, but Lord Shiva uh, at one point he was suggesting that the people of Vaikuntha are very great, but then Lord Shiva pointed out that Lord Krishna is already there in Dwarka and he's performing his pastimes in Dwarka. But Narada Muni was then told by Lord Shiva that there's a special devotee 
who is really a great devotee, and he's confid it's confidential, not everyone knows, but his name is Prahlad. And Lord Shiva is telling Narada Muni about the glories of Prahlad Maharaj. That this personality, Prahlad, He's been devoted his whole life. From his very birth, he's been a devotee. Of course, when he was in the womb of his mother, at that time, his mother was in the ashram of Narada Muni. So Narada Muni had been giving him instruction. Later on, the lady left the ashram of Narada Muni went to be with her husband and her husband of course was the the famous infamous Haranyakashipu. And so Prahlad Maharaj was born in that family. So it was not a very good birth to be born in a family of such a personality. Of course you could say well you a Brahmin, you know, because Haranyakashipu and Haranyaksha, they're both, their brothers and their uh, they're twins. They're the children of Kashyapa and, uh, and Diti, Kashyapa and Diti. So they're Brahmins, but they're very uh, demonic also. <laughs> They're great demons and very much against Lord Vishnu. So Prahlad Maharaj was born into that family and with the, under the uh, influence of, under the supervision of his father, he was sent to Gurukula and he was supposed to learn how to be a good demon. But we all know what happened in the Gurukula, the Prahlad, such a great devotee that wherever he goes, he's always preaching Krishna consciousness. For Prahlad Maharaj, there's no question of fear of the material world. He's totally fearless. Material life, we're eating, sleeping, mating, and fearing. The four animal propensities. But fearing is not something which pure devotees have. The pure devotees are all fearless. It was pointed out in relation to the Vaikuntha Basis that they're without fear. And they don't worry about the three debts. There are three debts which we take with the birth in this world. Three debts are, first of all, the debt, debt to the demigods the devas, debts to the parents, and debts to the great sages. So everyone is born with these three debts. Debt to the demigods, because the demigods are providing everything for our maintenance and sustenance in this world. The rain, the air, the water, and all the different food which we eat. Everything, it's all under the control of the different demigods. And we have to repay our debt to the demigods. And we're supposed to repay that debt to the demigods by offering sacrifice. And then there's a debt to our parents because we're born into a family with a particular karma. From the parents, we inherit the karma 
and different proclivities to engage in different activities. You know, we all have our different natures which we've acquired. And that is due to the parents. We take it, we inherit these things from the parents. And so we're supposed to repay the debt to the parents. And you repay the debt to the parents by having children, producing progeny. And this way the parents are satisfied when they see their children married and they have their own children, then they're, they're very happy, right? That's the way of the world. And then we have debt also to the great sages. The great sages, people like Vyasa Dev and so on, people who wrote the scriptures, we're indebted to them. And we have to repay our debt to them by studying the scriptures. We should study the scriptures and we should teach, go on and teach it to others. And then this way we can satisfy the sages. So Srila Prabhupada wanted very much that we would also study his books and uh, continue to distribute the message of Krishna consciousness through book distribution. So those three debts are there. But for the pure devotees, like the Vaikuntavasis and pure devotees in this world, they don't have a fear for these debts. They're not thinking about these kind of debts, obligations, oh, debt to the demigods and debt to the parents and debt to the sages. No, for one who has taken shelter of the Supreme Lord Krishna, then he's free from any debts and obligations. He doesn't have to worry about repaying these people because he's taken to devotional service. So he's free of all these kind of debt encumbrances which are there because he's taken, and even if, he, even if he's not successful in Krishna consciousness, still he's not considered a sinner. You may think, oh, you see, he, he tried to be Krishna conscious, he tried to be a devotee, and he didn't pay his debts, he didn't meet his obligations to the people who he was supposed to repay. And he went to Krishna, and he's not successful. He didn't become a pure devotee. So, is there a, there, there's no fall down. There's no fall down because he made the attempt to become Krishna conscious. And anyone who makes the attempt to become Krishna conscious, that is glorious. And he will go on from wherever he left off in this life, he will go on in the next life to continue that. But what does a man profit if he, give, if he, if he just simply performs his duty perfectly? according to varnas and ashrams. What does he profit if he does not become God conscious? There's no gain. There's no profit. There's no, no good result coming. Prabhupada quotes the, the Christian saying that, what does a man profit if he gain the whole world but lose his eternal soul? So that is what happens if you stay in the material world, you may pay your debts to the sages and the, the parents and the demigods, but what do you profit at the end of life? There's no, there's no benefit. You just simply take birth again in the material world. But if we make an attempt 
to become Krishna conscious. That is glorious. So in this way, the devotees of Krishna are without fear. And Prahlad Maharaj is also without fear. Although his father is the most terrifying demon, Prahlad is without fear. And even his father tries so many ways to kill him, Prahlad is not afraid. They throw him off the cliff, Prahlad is not afraid. They put him in the well with all the snakes, Prahlad is not afraid. They try to pierce him with tridents, Prahlad is not afraid. Because he's fully Krishna conscious. He's fully absorbed in praying and remembering the Lord. So this is a wonderful feature of Prahlad Maharaj. That he has no material desire at all. And he doesn't even desire to get liberation. So it happened that Prahlad was so, it was it, his Prahlad's teaching was such a disturbance to his father that his father wanted to kill him. Now his father had tried to give Prahlad to other people to kill him and they had not been successful. Different people, they tried, they put him under the feet of the elephant. They, they put him in the well with the poison snakes. They threw him off the cliff. They threw him into the sea. They tried everything to kill him. They couldn't kill him. So then Haranyakashipu thinks, I'll kill him myself. Because there was, it was becoming so tense. And Haranyakashipu was becoming so disturbed by the preaching of Prahlad. And Prahlad is preaching to all the, the other demons. And he's telling them, don't waste the human life. Spend our time play football and cricket and this game and that game. And the whole life is over. Life is finished. No Krishna conscious. What is the good? So Prahlad was preaching to the other sons of the demons and he was trying to give them Krishna consciousness. But the teachers found out and the teachers told Haranyakashipu. So Haranyakashipu is very angry that my son is trying to preach this Krishna consciousness to the sons of the other demons. So he's, he wants to kill Prahlad. But, of course, then he was tested. Lord Nasringadeva appeared. Lord Nasringadeva appeared to, pro to protect Prahlad. And Lord Nasringadeva appeared from the pillar just to prove the words of his devotee. Because Prahlad is such a great devotee that the Lord is obliged to serve his devotees. It was mentioned here that the Lord values his pure devotees more than he values anything else, more than he values even the, the goddess of fortune, who is his consort, more than he values the service of Brahma or the service of Lord Shiva, more than he values any of these other demigods. The Lord values the pure devotees, those who have completely surrendered to the Lord, to take shelter of the Lord. They are the ones who are most dear to the Lord. And the Lord is he's ready to give himself up for the service of his pure devotees. So pure devotees mean people like Prahlad, because Prahlad doesn't care anything about his own self. The pure devotees have no material desire, and they can give up all the connection with the family, 
and they can give up all of their wealth. They can leave behind everything just for the sake of the Supreme Lord. So this is why the Lord feels so much indebted to his pure devotees. He feels the greatest love for these pure devotees because they've sacrificed everything for the service of the Lord. So Lord Nasringadev was very angry when he fought with Haranyakashipu because Haranyakashipu had been trying to kill Prahlad. And because Prahlad is such a pure devotee, he's such a dear devotee of the Lord, Lord Nasringade became very angry. And he came and he fought with Haranyakashipu and ultimately killed Haranyakashipu. And after he killed Haranyakashipu, then Lord Nasringade was very angry. And they tried to pacify Lord Nasringadeva in different ways. And they brought many people. They brought Lord Brahma. Now, Lord Brahma, he was the one who gave the benedictions to Haranyakashipu. So Lord Brahma came, he tried to offer prayers. It didn't do anything. Lord Nasringadeva was still very angry. They brought one demigod after another. And then they brought his own consort, his own wife, the goddess of fortune. But even then, still the Lord is just angry. He's just roaring, roaring. Just He's so enraged. You know, when, when a person gets angry, we don't like to go near them. So you could imagine what it's like, Lord Nasringadev when he's angry. A half lion, half person is angry. You're not going to get too close. You just want to stay away. So uh, that was the, the situation. But then they had an idea that how to pacify Lord Nasringade because he's been angry for a long time now. Then they thought, Prahlad. Let Prahlad try. So they brought Prahlad. And actually, Lord Nasringadev, the reason why he'd been so angry was because of the treatment which Prahlad had been getting from his father. Lord Nasringadev was greatly pained to see his pure devotee, Prahlad, suffering and accepting so many difficulties. So Prahlad comes in front of Lord Nishringadev and he offers his obeisances and then he stands up and Lord Nishringadev is so pleased. Lord Nishringadev in different places, different scriptures, they give different descriptions. In Srimad Bhagavatam, it describes how Lord Nishringadev patted Prahlad on the head. He put his hand, lotus hand, the lotus hand of Lord Nishringadev went on the head of Prahlad Maharaj. And from that touch of Lord Nishringadev, then Prahlad Maharaj was filled with Divya Gyan and he could offer prayers to Lord Nishringadev. This is the potency of Lord Nishringadev that he can inspire his devotee and he can give them all the powers they may need for his service. So Prahlad Maharaj was blessed with the touch of Lord Nasringadev's lotus hand on his head and he began to offer prayers and he is glorifying the Lord and he's describing everything which happened. And then, after he, Prahlad had offered prayers, then Lord Nasringadev wants Prahlad to take a benediction. But Prahlad says, no, I don't want anything. 
The Lord said, I am not a businessman. I am not a merchant or a trader. Like business people, you give, you, they give the goods, get the money, right? There has to be some exchange. They'll give something and they get something back. They'll give the goods people want. And then they get the money for all the goods. So Prahlad Maharaj, he said to Lord Nishingadev that I am not a merchant. I am not in business. I am not your devotee just to get something from you. So this is very important, of course. This is the mood of Srimad Bhagavatam. Dharma Prajita Kaitava Traparamo Narmatsaranam Satam. The Srimad Bhagavatam propounds the highest truth. It completely rejects all religion which are materially motivated. This is very important. We don't want to be motivated for material gain. We want to get spiritual purification. So Haranyakashipu had been killed and Prahlad feels great relief and he's, uh, he's coming before Lord Nishringadev but Lord Nishringadev he sees Prahlad Maharaj and Prahlad gets the lotus hand on his head Prahlad offers his prayers and Lord Nishringadev wants to give him benediction what do you like I can give you, I can give you cows, I can give you land, I can give you grain, I can give you gold, I can give you the, the nice daughter of a Brahmana for a wife, whatever you want. But Prahlad Maharaj said, why I want something? I am not a businessman. I am not worshipping you to get something in return. This is very important. This is the main point of, of our Krishna consciousness movement. People don't understand. They are thinking Krishna consciousness to be just like some other religious thing. But they don't understand that we worship Krishna in the mood of pure devotion, without a desire for anything in return. Prabhupada trained us like that, to give everything to Krishna. We don't need anything ourselves. We want to give everything for the service of Krishna. And when we give everything for Krishna's service, Krishna will give everything more and everything and more back to us. You're never the loser when you surrender to Krishna. You give something to Krishna, you'll get more back. So if we surrender fully, if we give the, you know, these uh, different lectures which we're having online, we give them. To, for the, the service of Krishna, the same way Krishna will give us so much more back. He will want to repay us by giving us whatever we could use in his service. The devotee, like Prahlad, Prahlad doesn't want anything material. The devotee has no material desires. And here we see Lord Nasringadev, he's testing, just like Krishna will test sometimes. Who will get tested? Even very advanced devotees will be tested. Lord Buddha was tested. Jesus Christ was tested. Lord Nityananda was tested. Haridas Thakur was tested. Even 
new devotees, neophyte devotees are also tested. Do you really want Krishna? Who wants Krishna? Who, yeah, 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 you want, of course. But who wants, who wants Krishna and who wants just simply to get Krishna's energy? Prabhupada used to say, people want the kingdom of God without God, right? How is it possible? The kingdom of God without the same way people want, we want Krishna's energy. We don't want Krishna. We want to enjoy Krishna's energy. Just like we were talking the other day about Ravan. He wanted to take Sita away from Lord Rama. So this is the, the demonic mentality. We are fighting this demonic mentality. We are preaching Krishna conscious to everyone. Prabhupada would say, finish up your business. Stop doing business with Krishna. Business will look for something in return. I'm giving this, you give me back. I'll give you the goods, give me the money. Where's the cash? Right? But devotional service is just simply give, 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 give our love, give our life for the service of Krishna. So Prahlad Maharaj, he has that mood in his service to Krishna. So when Lord Narsingadev comes and he wants to give him benediction, Prahlad said, no, no, I'm not a merchant. I am not worshipping you just to get something. I want pure devotion. Anyway, it happened that because Haranya Kashipu had been killed by Lord Nasringadev, somebody has to become the ruler. So who's going to sit on the throne? So who's going to become the, the king in place of Haranya Kashipu? So Prahlad was given that position. Prahlad was seated on the royal throne. But Prahlad said, I will only accept this position. I will only sit on the throne with the mood that I'm going to give Krishna consciousness to all the citizens. I want to give everyone Krishna consciousness. That is Prahlad Maharaj. He doesn't care about anything material. He wants to give Krishna consciousness the most precious thing. And he wants to give it to all the conditioned souls who are suffering in material existence. So this is the mood of Prahlad Maharaj. He just wants to give. So he, he will become, he's, he, he accepts the throne. He agrees to be the king and he's coronated, but it's not for sense gratification. There's no thought of sense gratification. His only thought is to give Krishna consciousness to others. So this is why Lord Shiva is glorifying Prahlad Maharaj. He wants that Narada Muni should understand the wonderful position of Prahlad, that he really is a great devotee. Of course, when Narada Muni will go there and meet Prahlad, then Prahlad will deny it. He's not going to accept Lord. Lord Shiva's uh, statement. And we, but first we have to hear more about the glories of Prahlad Maharaj, how he is such a wonderful devotee, that he is so fixed in Krishna consciousness, and that he has no, he's not hateful of anyone. He feels compassion. Although his father tried to kill him in so many ways, 
Prahlad was concerned that, please don't let my father go to hell. That was Prahlad's request. You want to give me some benediction? Please don't let my father go to hell. And Lord Nishingadev said, you don't have to worry. Not only will your father not go to hell, but for 14 generations, they won't go to hell. In your family for 14 generations, no one will have to go to hell. They're all delivered because of Prahlad, because of your devotion, because of you, your mood of self-sacrifice to give everything for Lord, for the service of the Lord. So you've delivered your entire family for 14 generations. Prahlad Maharaj, he, he asked Lord Nishringadev, he said, if you want to give me any benediction, then simply bless me that in my heart there will be no desire for sense gratification. That is the real blessing a devotee wants. Bless me that in my heart there will be no desire for material pleasure. Devotees are like Prahlad Maharaj. They're situated in bliss. They're always blissful. Prabhupada chastised that one servant of his. He had one servant. His name was Purushottam. 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 And Prabhupada said, Purushottam, you cannot be in Krishna consciousness if you are morose. If you're morose, then you're not in Krishna consciousness. Devotee means uh, prasanatma, mm. right? Brahma Buddha prasanna, joyful souls, bright faces, Hare Krishna people, all bright faced, happy, the happy Krishnas, because they're tasting the bliss of spiritual life, the pleasure of spiritual activities. We're all trying to enjoy, we're looking for enjoyment. So there, it, it's not, and it's not wrong. Rather, it's the nature of the soul. The soul wants to enjoy, it wants happiness. The problem is we're trying to find the happiness in the wrong place. You have to take the happiness which is there in relation to Krishna, not in relation to the material world. We get lost in the material world. We're trying to find happiness by satisfying our senses. We will never be happy in that way. But if we take shelter of the Lord, then we can experience the bliss, the spiritual pleasure of life. The soul's nature is such an ananda. And if we're not ananda, if we're not in bliss, then it means we're not thinking of Krishna. We're thinking simply of the body. So Prahlad Maharaj, he's always in bliss. Even though his father's trying to kill him all the time, his father's so angry with him, his father's a big demon. Prahlad is always in bliss. He's happy. And he, he doesn't stop preaching. He's telling his father that this con consciousness of I and mine, this is very wrong. This is very bad. You definitely want to give up that consciousness of thinking I am this body and this is mine. That is not the mood of devotional service. We have to give up that mentality that I am this, I am the center of the universe, I am the controller. Like Karanya Kashipu is thinking, I am God. Karanya Kashipu, he wanted that. He wanted to become the supreme. But of course, he was finished by the one moment, by the, the blow of Lord Nishringadev's nails across his chest. It finished the life of Haranyakashi. 
So Krishna consciousness is natural for Prahlad Maharaj. He doesn't have any trouble at all in being Krishna conscious. It's no austerity for him. It's bliss. To fix the mind on Krishna is not an austerity. It's the highest bliss to fix the mind on. Sometimes people think, oh, very austere, oh, very, <laughs> very austere. Krishna Prasadam, very austere. <laughs> yeah. they, they don't know the bliss of spiritual life. Taking Prasadam is blissful. Chanting Hare Krishna is blissful. Hearing about Krishna is blissful. Everything we do, it is all nectar. It is all bliss. So we, we shouldn't doubt the potency of Krishna. So Prahlad Maharaj is such a great devotee. He cannot forget the Lord, whatever situation he's in. So that's why Lord Nishringa Dev has so much love for his pure devotee. Lord Nishringadev will give him his own self for his pure devotion. The Lord says, without saintly, without saintly persons for whom I am the only destination, I do not desire to enjoy my transcendental bliss or my supreme opulence. This is a, state, a statement which is also found in Srimad Bhagavatam in the ninth canto. It describes the, the mood which is there between the Lord and his pure devotees. The Lord cannot tolerate not having the association of saintly person. So that was why when Prahlad Maharaj came in front of Lord Nishringadev, Lord Nishringadev shed tears. He was so angry, but then Prahlad came in front of him. Lord Nishringadev shed tears to see Prahlad. And he picked up Prahlad and it said he was licking all over his body. Lord Nishringadev had so much love for Prahlad because Prahlad had so much love for the Lord. So it's reciprocal. If you think of Krishna five hours a day, Krishna will think of you six hours a day. If you think of Krishna 24 hours a day, Krishna will think of you 26 hours a day. The Lord is always going to repay. He's always going to give more. If we take one step towards Krishna, Krishna will take five steps towards us. So Krishna, he always reciprocates with the devotee and he cares for the devotee. And when the devotees are in difficulty, the Lord is always going to come there because he wants to save the devotee. He thinks these devotees, are, they're suffering so much on my behalf. Let me go there and help them. So th this is the mood of Lord Nishringadev. Oh, Lord Nishringadev considers his own body not to be as valuable or as important as that of his pure devotee. Lord Nishringadev doesn't care about his own body. He doesn't care about the goddess of fortune who is his own consort. He doesn't care about his senior demigods like Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva. He only cares about his pure devotees. 
who have given up everything for the service of the Lord. They leave their homes, they leave their jobs, they give up their money, they give up everything simply for the pleasure of Lord Nisringadev. So it said, among all these pure devotees, Prahlad stands out from them all. Prahlad Maharaj stands out from all the other people who are, you know, maybe the other people are maybe thinking, oh, not, not very important. But Prahlad, he is scary. After Lord Nishingadev tears apart Haranyakashipu, then uh, the incident was witnessed by many different demigods. They were all watching in heaven. Somehow the demigods, they know about these different events when they're taking place. So the demigods were all watching and they could see Haranyakashi Pu fighting with Lord Nishringadev. And Lakshmi also witnessed. So Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, she is the consort of Lord Nishringadev. And when Lord Nishringadev was killing Haranyakashi Pu, then, of course, she's happy. But at the same time, she's worried. She's worried because she thought there will be other demigods, there will be other people. What, what, there's going to be more trouble. So Lakshmi was concerned. Uh, it, it says here, Oh, it says here that Lord Nishingadev only appeared there for the sake of Prahlad. He could have killed Haranyakashipu without appearing himself. But for the sake of Prahlad, Lord Nishingadev appears. So this is the love of the Lord for his devotees. That he came and he killed this Haranyakashipu. And we saw earlier that when Indra wanted the Lord to kill Vritasura, the Lord wasn't going to do it. And he told Indra, you do it yourself. Why I should do it? But, but Prahlad, Prahlad, he's not even asking anybody to do it. He's not asking the Lord for help. All, all that happened was Haranyakashipu wanted to know, where is your Lord? Is he in here? Is he in this pillar? And Prahlad said, yes. And so when Haranyakashipu cut the pillar, Lord Nishingadev came out from the pillar and fought with Haranyakashipu. Because the Lord wants to keep the word of his devotees. The devotees are truthful. And Prahlad is Uttama Adhikari. He sees the Lord everywhere. So when his father asked him, is he in the pillar? Yes, he's also there. He's everywhere. That is the nature of the Lord. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient and he's omnipotent. He, he's, he, he's everywhere. And Prahlad could realize, he had realized that, he'd understood that. So he appeared. Lord, so 
Prahlad Maharaj was offered benediction several times by Lord Nishringadev. Lord Nishringadev wanted him to take liberation, be liberated. But Prahlad Maharaj thinking, because Prahlad, it's all the same for Prahlad, right? Narayana Parasarve. So it doesn't matter, you're liberated or you're in hell or wherever you are, it's all the same. So Prahlad said, what's the point? Why I should be liberated? <laughs> no value for, for a pure devotee to be liberated. So, uh, Lord Nishingadev actually, uh, Prahlad Maharaj, when Bali Maharaj had been uh, sent to Sutala Loka at that time, Prahlad Maharaj was also present. And Lord Vamanadev said, I'm going to come there also with you. I'll come as your doorkeeper. And they told Prahlad Maharaj that, you know, Bali. Bali Maharaj is going to go there to Satala Loka, to the subterranean hellish planets or subterranean heavenly planets. And they told Prahlad Maharaj, you can also come there too. You can come and visit and we can enjoy association with each other. So Prahlad Maharaj agreed. He's ready to go there. And so he, he went there actually. Prahlad went there to Satala Loka to be there with Bali Maharaj, who was his grandson, and to be there also with Lord Vamanadev to enjoy the association of the Lord. Uh, so one thing which puzzled uh, Lord Shiva a little bit was that uh, why why did Lord Nish, why did uh, why did Lord Krishna not kill Bana Bana Sura Bana Sura was the eldest son of Bali Maharaj and Bana Sura has one thousand arms. But, and he was fighting against Lord, Lord Krishna. So Lord Krishna cut off his arms and left him with four arms and gave him a, a benediction that he wouldn't die, that he could be immune to old age and disease and he could stay in the association of Lord Shiva. So why did the Lord, why did Lord do that? You know, why didn't just kill him? He's a demon. The Lord had killed so many other demons. Why didn't kill Bana? Bana had done a lot of atrocities and he was fighting against Krishna. He'd arrested Ani, Ani Ruda and he was keeping Ani Ruda in prison. Ani Ruda, Krishna's grandson. So why didn't Krishna just kill? The reason was, it wasn't because Lord, one thing we may think, or because Lord Shiva came and offered prayers, because he's my devotee, so please don't kill him. But actually, the reason why the Lord didn't kill him was because his relationship with Prahlad Maharaj, because he's Prahlad's relative, and the Lord has promised that his large relatives are all going to be liberated. They're all safe. They're, none of them will go to hell. So because of the connection with Prahlad, he's safe. So this is, again, the point which comes over. It's the power of Prahlad, this devotion, having this devotee there, this pure devotee, great devotee. So even somebody's a big demon like Haranyakashipu and Banasura, but still because they're connected to Prahlad Maharaj, they're safe.
the Prahlad always acts out, the, the Lord is always acting out of affection for Prahlad Maharaj. So then uh, Lord Shiva tells uh, Narada Muni, you should go to Sutala. Go to Sutala Loka and see Prahlad for yourself. Prahlad is there. There you can see Prahlad Maharaj. you see he is the greatest devotee. He's got the blessings of the Lord. He's got the greatest mercy. So we'll hear. What happens when Narada goes there to Sutala? No. Devotees often, they, they don't like to go to hell. They like to go to heaven, you know? You get people, they will come, you know, especially we get devotees, they come from Bangladesh or somewhere and they come to India. They come first to Mayapur, then from Mayapur, they will go to Mumbai. And then from Mumbai, then they'll go to America. And then when they get to America, they'll go to Hawaii. Because <laughs> uh, Hawaii is the nearest thing to heavenly planets. The heavenly planets, a lot of, you know, sense gratification there, very heavenly, tropical, warm you know never cold like that so people they want to go to heavenly planets they like to they say i'll preach there <laughs> but you ask them go to hell and preach nobody wants to go you know? <laughs> Prabhupada sent this one devotee he told him to go to easter in europe go to russia go there and prob he said Prabhupada. There's no vegetables there. In the winter, everybody has to eat meat. And Prabhupada said, then eat meat, but go there. <laughs> right? Prabhupada was sending this devotee, he told him to go there and preach. He was trying to make excuses why he didn't want to go. But, but Prabhupada said, even you have to eat meat, you go there. Of course, you don't have to eat meat. There's so many vegetables. Or you can potatoes, right? Kar kartoshka. Russian. In Russian, potatoes are kartoshka. <laughs> kartoshka. Potatoes and cabbage. <laughs> okay, any question? Uh, in the days of uh, Srila Prabhupada's uh, Prabhupada disciples, towards the uh, after Prabhupada passed, Prabhupada uh, left the world. Uh, many of the disciples uh, they were actually they had, uh, they were in the they joined the movement in the very young time, and they also left their educations or their uh, jobs, and uh, they had no training. So many of them they gave gave up all that. Uh, but uh, what we hear also that uh, over a period of time uh, they had difficulty uh, in uh, maintaining themselves or their families or uh, something like that. So uh, in the but they had out of enthusiasm and love for Prabhupada they gave their uh, energy and time and uh, whatever they had also. So but uh, they had difficulty later on. So because of which some of the devotees also they could not maintain their spiritual life also what we hear. So I just wanted uh, in this light, uh, as you were mentioning, to understand this incident. So what? To understand that how uh, that how is there uh, what? Yeah. 
Well, we know from the Bhagavad Gita, there's no loss. Whatever progress, whatever devotional service, whatever advancement they made, they'll go on from there. Even they give up Krishna consciousness for some time, or maybe for this life, next life, they can go on, they'll come back, continue from where they left off. Whatever service they did, that's to their credit. They did some service, just like different devotees. You know, there's one devotee, maybe, you know, uh, well, I won't say his name. But anyway, he was a sannyasi, and he was a, a leading devotee. And he led a lot of devotees. He was in charge of a lot of brahmacharis, and they would collect money, and they bring it to Prabhupada, give it all to Prabhupada. And after some time, after Prabhupada left, somehow, you know, some difficulties that came in and, and somehow he fell out of sannyas. But he knows that he said, he said, uh, I was, he said, maybe I wasn't a very good sannyasi, but he said, I did some service for Prabhupada. So the mood was there that he wanted to serve Prabhupada. He had, they, have, they had great love and regard for Prabhupada and tried to do some service for Prabhupada. In course of time, you know, material desires come well up and they're not able to cope with it and somehow they get swept away. Sometimes they go far away and sometimes not so far away. You know, some people, they, some people maybe they go right away from Krishna consciousness and other people, they there's, they stay in Krishna consciousness, but just change their position, take up, change that ashram, you know. Sometimes people, maybe they were leading as sannyasis, but somehow they, you know, they're not able to maintain the vows of sannyas. So they enter into Grihastha life, and they, but they continue in Krishna consciousness. They continue still preaching. No loss. My question is, Maharaj, uh, yeah, in terms of spiritual life, uh, yeah, some could continue. But in terms of their material well-being, they uh, my, some of the devotees also share that uh, due to immaturity, we did, we did not uh, take, uh, we, we sometimes we did overboarding. Well, again, then it's their karma. Some different devotees have different karmas. You see, generally, somebody they, they come to Krishna consciousness. And somehow they have the nature, they, they always have money and they make a lot of money. And if they go out of Krishna consciousness, they still have money and they make money. You know, they, they have that karma that they're, you know, they know how to get money and how to, they have that ability. So I've seen the different people who were in Krishna consciousness at one point and then they go out of Krishna consciousness, you know, they're, Karma is pretty much the same. That they, if they had they, they had a lot of money when they were devotees. They made a lot of money in Krishna consciousness. They go out of Krishna consciousness. They're still making. They get money. They manage. Of course, they have to work. They have to do something to make money. But they, you know, they have the brain. They know how to do it. They have that ability. They were using that ability before in Krishna consciousness, and they go out of Krishna consciousness, that ability is still with them. They know how to do it, how to get money, and how to make money. Some people may have difficulties, some, some may have difficulties. But if they've done a lot of service in the past, if they did a lot of service and they give a lot to Krishna, then it's to their credit. 
yeah, the, you cannot, cannot expect to get everything you want, you know, everything you want. There were some people who were like very, very big, very prominent in Krishna consciousness. Some of them like spiritual masters and like that, and they go out of Krishna consciousness. So the, they don't have problems usually. They, well, it varies. There are maybe some, one or two, you know, so they, they maybe they were very opulent as devotees, but they go out of Krishna consciousness, they have difficulties, they have problems. Yeah. But, you know, they somehow they go on with their life, you know, you have to go on with your life. Different devotees they face these difficulties. Sometimes they feel bitter, some bitterness about it, that I did so much for the Krishna consciousness movement. No, nobody's helping me now. I did so much in the past, but now nobody's helping me. And so the, it, it's regrettable. But whatever service they've done for Krishna is to their credit. That's always there. And whenever Prabhupada would meet people who were in Krishna consciousness and had gone away, Prabhupada would always encourage them to come back. He would always encourage them, you come back, you join, be with us. Even you're not, maybe you before you were the sannyasi, still you come back and be with us. Prabhupada always appreciated whatever service devotees had done for the Krishna consciousness movement. And he felt very sorry to see them go away. He would say, we, we shed gallons of blood to bring one person to Krishna consciousness. And if they go away, then it's such a shame, such a, a waste. Because it's so much difficulty to bring one person in and to train them and get them, you know, all fixed up in Krishna consciousness, get them that, that they learn everything, they know everything, but then somehow they, they go away. So it's, it, it's a great tragedy to see them go. Of course, we know that it's temporary, that after some time they'll come back. But still, you know, rather, why don't they come back immediately? Why go away at all? Better they just stay and just adjust, make some adjustment to their situation. I mean, these things don't just happen in our Krishna consciousness movement. In Madhvacharya's line also, you find like that. There's different sannyasis, some people in charge of matsya. They have 12, how many months they have? Huh? No, how Eight. many temples do they have though? Eight. Eight months, in Udupi, eight months, is it? So, like one of the Sometimes one of the people who are in charge of one of the months, you know, sometimes they, they give up their sannyas. It happened. It, it doesn't just happen only in Krishna consciousness. It happens also even in the Madhva line. Maybe because they became sannyasis when they were very young and difficult to maintain as they grow up. And that is why Pechari Mat sannyasi, he doesn't want these top tabala sannyas. Huh? Because he had some difficulties also. There had been difficult sometimes. Some sannyasi. They couldn't keep it. They gave up the sannyas. And so in Iskon also, they made a lot of provisions before taking sannyas. You know, it must be at least at least 40 years old. And you know, Prabhupada's time. 
Prabhupada was giving sannyas, you know, Jayapataka Swami took sannyas, he was 19 or 18, like that. He'd been in the movement a year or something. <laughs> yeah. But now, you know, now you, you have to be at least 40 and you have to do bhakti by bhav, you have to do so many things, you know, a lot of, a lot of requirements. And that way, try to keep more sanctity in the spiritual order, because it create, created a bad impression. This is why we have the Hare Krishna Hill. You know, the Hare Krishna Hill, although he didn't have the problem, he's a disciple of Jayapadaka Maharaj, he was initiated by Jayapadaka but he saw others, other sannyasis, other <laughs> But he's light, light, light. What I mean to say, light, 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 heaviness, little children, light. Try ah, to okay. keep people. And I even already is our good news. What's the other one? You look on the other way. So we try to avoid this disturbances in the social order and that way then nobody can complain mm -hmm. even even that it happens you know even in old age people sometimes even they get old in 60 70 even you know they want to change <laughs> give up sannyas and go home or something <laughs> I heard uh, it was the Swami Narayan people. The Swami Narayan, there was somebody there. He, would, he became a, in the ashram, living in that, and he got old. He wanted to go home. The family said, "No, no, <laughs> don't, don't come home. You can't come home. Stay in the ashram." <laughs> so. Try to take care of everyone. Implementing Varnashram, very important. Proper brahmachari training. And then Grihastha also should be, people should be properly guided. They should know how to arrange or organize their Griha, their Grihastha Ashram. And then they can go on. And they can move on to Vanaprastha, Sanya. But Prabhupada did the things the way he did them. Tamal Krishna Maharaj asked Prabhupada one time, he said, he said, it would, if you had to do it all again, would you change anything? Would you have done, would you make some changes? Because, you know, the way Prabhupada did it, you know, all so many young people and then giving sannyas to young men and everything like that, you know. So he asked, would you have changed anything? And Prabhupada said, no. He said, no, I wouldn't have changed anything. I'd done, I would have done everything just the way I did it again. I wouldn't change it. Put everything into preaching. You know, Prabhupada had everybody preaching. Everybody on Sankirtan book distribution. Temples were all just run, maintained by book distribution. Whatever income we got, half of it had to go for the BBT and half for maintenance. You know, in Prabhupada's time, people would see devotees everywhere, at least in, in the USA. <laughs> in the USA, you could see the devotees around. Devotees were very active. Nowadays, sometimes people say, hey, where are you people been? <laughs> you know? They ask us, where have you been 
I've never seen you for you. I never see you around anymore. Where have you been? No more Hari Nam, no more Hari, you know. Okay. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you.